Today we're in chapter 2. Let's begin reading together 1 Timothy chapter 2 at verse 1. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 today. So we'll begin reading here in 1 Timothy 2 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 8 and we'll get into our study. What we're looking at is the subject of prayer for the lost. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, And therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ, not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so, as is my normal way of teaching, let me remind you of a few things. Lay a foundation so that we can see the direction that Paul is taking here in 1 Timothy in chapter 2. Remember with me that the Apostle Paul had left behind in the city of Ephesus a young man by the name, name of Timothy who was pastoring the church there in Ephesus. And what he was doing is he was, he was setting things in proper order in the church. So one thing that needed to be set in order would be the church's mission. You see, every church has a mission. The church has a mission. And there are sometimes even what we call mission statements, or we have certain elements that we've discovered in Scripture that become the foundations, the fundamentals, the, the, the personality revealed through the mission statement. And every church has that. We have a mission statement here. Our desire is for this church to be built on the Word of God, the worship of God, the witness of God's people, as well as the witness of God's people. Those are our four pillars. And so every church has a foundation. There's something fundamental to it. And what Paul is doing here is he's, he's saying, you need to set in order the church's mission. And its mission is to present the message of the gospel clearly in order to rescue sinners. He had already said that in chapter 1, verse 15. Look with me for just a moment how, how Paul had said in chapter 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so Paul has already stated that the church is there to rescue sinners. And so what he's doing now is he's urging Timothy to remember to pray for the lost. So let me develop this for just a moment. The Bible teaches that before you are saved, the Bible teaches that we are actually separated. Before you are saved, you are separated from God. And that which separates us from God, once again, the Bible is very clear, is our sin. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the prophet writes, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so, so that he will not hear. So you are separated, he says, from God, a holy God, by your sin. Sin makes separation. And because sin makes separation, we do not have a relationship with God. So Jesus Christ came in order to bridge between sinful man and the holy God. He was the bridge to do that. He came, as he says, to seek and to save those who are lost. And because sin made separation, Jesus became what is called the sin offering. And he's a sin offering on our behalf. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so Jesus has been called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he freely offers us life. He presents us forgiveness of sins. And he does so in a message that is called the gospel. The Bible says that we are commanded to repent and to receive Christ. And in doing so, repenting and receiving, we are forgiven. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30 it reads, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. 
And so when you repent and receive Christ, the door of heaven is open to you. And now we're God's children. And as God's children, we have access to him and we can speak to him. And that's because we become his children. We speak to him as our father. Now that amazes me that God, the God of heaven, the God who created all things, the God who created this universe and all that's within it, has opened the door for us to have relationship with him. And that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. I remember seeing something years ago in the news, years ago, and then it was repeated, and it has been repeated often throughout the years, how that uh, one of our presidents, John F. Kennedy, how he would be in the middle of his meetings and his son, John John, they called him John John, would come walking in. And it didn't matter that he was in the midst of a meeting. Whenever John would walk in, the small one would come in, his father would give him attention. And I understand that because as a pastor, when, when I was uh, in my office, even to this day, when I'm in my office and I'm working and I'm preparing something, you know, my children always had access to me. They could walk in at any given time. And today, I'll have meetings. I have meetings on Monday. I have meetings on Tuesday. And there are times when my daughter will bring uh, her, her little girl in, my, my Stella. Stella's uh, five years old. And, and I'll be there in my, in my office having a meeting. There'll be several people, staff members. And here comes Stella. And Stella just will open the door. And she'll just come walking in. And, and it doesn't matter that there's all these people that are doing ministry here in the church. And She'll just walk in, and when she walks in, it doesn't matter that I'm having a meeting. I'll just turn, and she'll come, and she'll sit on my lap, and she'll give me a kiss, and she'll hold me. As long as she wants to be there, she's going to be there, and everybody in that office is going to wait. And that's just the way it is. Why? Because that's my baby. That's how it works. And so she doesn't need special permission. She doesn't need an appointment. She doesn't need to call in advance. She doesn't need to wait in line. She just walks in. And guess what, guys? You can do that with the Lord. God himself, let that settle on you. God himself, God himself. You can walk into the throne room of God himself in your time of need and get help. That's the father that you have. And that's what Jesus wants us to know. He wants us to know that through him, we can have a relationship with his father. And that's how it works. We have a relationship with God, our holy God, because the bridge builder, Jesus himself, has taken the hand of sinful man, taken the hand of holy God, and brought us together through him. That's how it works. You confess your sin. God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I receive Christ as my Lord and my Savior, and his blood washes and cleanses you. You are now transferred from darkness into, into light. You are now one who was lost. Now you're found. You were once not a son. Now you are a son or a daughter of God, and you can enter into that throne room because of him. The Bible in 1 Peter 3.12 says it like this, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So now you're saved. And what do you do? Well, you pray for those who have yet come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we're seeing here in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. Paul begins to address prayer for the lost in this chapter. Notice in verse 1, 1 Timothy 2, Paul begins by saying, therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So Paul reveals that we pray for the lost in various ways. And he says that there are supplications. He says there are prayers and intercessions. He speaks of the giving of thanks. And so we'll look at that briefly, each one of those things. He said, so, first of all, he said that supplications be made. The word supplication speaks of requests. Requests that arise from a deep sense of need. It's like the woman with the demon-possessed daughter who came to Christ. In Matthew 15, 22, it says, Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. She had an incredible sense of need. There was a deep urgency within her. Mark 7, 26 says that the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So this is what she's doing. She's making a request from a deep sense of need. It's a supplication. 
This is also exhibited when, when a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus was there on the road to Jericho. And according to, to Mark 10, 47 and 48, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So that's a supplication. That's an entreaty. That's a request that arises from a deep sense of need. And so knowing that something is lacking, we're to pray that God will supply that which is lacking. And in the case of those whom he's commanding us to pray for, what is lacking is salvation. And so we call to him and we ask the Lord to reach them. In Psalm 18, verse 6, it says, In my distress I called upon the Lord, cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. My cry came before him, even to his ears. And so you make, out your, you make your cry out, you, you cry often to him about that, that the Lord might save. You know, often people are saved because somebody has prayed for them, and they don't even realize that somebody is praying for them to be saved. And then the invitation is given, and they come to faith in the Lord. Do you know that? Your prayers have been very often answered by the Lord on behalf of strangers, strangers who came to faith in Christ. Even right now, right this minute as I'm teaching, and every time I teach, there's a group of people who are right, right I can see the room that they're in right now. They're praying for you right now. We have prayer every time I teach, every time Bible study goes. There are men who are gathered together right now praying for the people in this church, especially for those who are lost. And people get saved because people are praying for them. God answers those prayers. And sometimes you don't even realize your prayers are gonna be answered. When I was, because um, you're praying for strangers. When I was younger, I, I was one of these guys, I'll say this quickly, I was one of these guys who, who I think when I was born, I wanted to be married from that moment I, 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 the first time I ever proposed to someone to marry me, I was four years old. I mean, I wanted to get married. Her name was Bernadette Archuleta. I still remember Bernadette. Her cousin goes to this church. And uh, yeah, I wanted Bernadette to be my bride. So, you know, Becky Martinez, you know. I mean, there was a lot of, I could name a lot of girls, you know. <laughs> Becky Padilla, Sandy Martinez, I don't want them to get mad. 63 years later, but um, no, but I wanted to get married in the worst way. And so when I got saved, and I still did, I said, oh no, now I can get married. Now I can pray according to the will of God and I can have a bride. And, and Father, I, 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 I want to get married. And I was 20 years old. I still remember going to Bible studies and young women would come walking in and I'd claim them in the name of Jesus, you know. <laughs> that one's mine. I, oh yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. They, they resisted his spirit. <laughs> and then one day, one day, I finally realized that you've got to stop this. You've got to just concentrate on the Lord. And so I prayed another prayer, and this prayer was, Father, put me to sleep to my desires, even as you brought Eve to Adam by first allowing a deep sleep to come upon him. I would pray that you would put me to sleep to those desires and that, Lord, you will bring the woman that you desire for me. I prayed that prayer. And then within three weeks, I was teaching a Bible study when a young woman came into that Bible study who was unsaved. And within three weeks or so after coming to her first Bible study, she gave her heart to Christ and she needed discipling. So I married her. And so I was praying for my future bride who was unsaved at that time without even knowing it. Sometimes your prayers are being answered in ways you don't even realize. Praying for the lost, praying for people to know Christ, to come to faith in Christ. And so God would have us supplicate. He would have us to ask a deep entreaty from a depth of a heart, God, save people and you'll be surprised at how wonderfully he can answer those prayers and how that will bless you. So he speaks of supplications. The second thing, he speaks of prayers. Now prayers are obviously directed to God. 
So the word carries the idea of worship as well as reverence. So we pray for the lost because when they're saved, they exalt and they praise him. In Psalm 18, verse 46, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So prayers are directed to God. The word carries the idea of worship and reverence. So you're praying that they'll be saved so that they may exalt and praise him. A third, he speaks of intercession. We are to make intercessions on behalf, he says, of the lost. Intercessions literally means getting involved in someone's life. You're involved in their struggles, so that means you have empathy, compassion, you have sympathy. And the reason we have this is because we know that without the Lord, they will perish, and therefore you passionately pray for the lost, because they're going to be lost, and they're going to be judged. When Moses went to Mount Sinai to receive the law, while he was there receiving the law, the Bible teaches us that the people rose up and sinned. They saw that Moses was delaying returning, and so they spoke to his brother Aaron. They said, we want a, a visible God that we may worship. So Aaron told them to bring their golden earrings to him, and he melted the gold, and he made what is called a golden calf. Now, when Moses returned, the people, the Scripture says, had risen up to play. Exodus 32, 9 and 10 says, The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Indeed, it is a, a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now, earlier in his life, Moses, when he was around 40 years of age, knew that he was to deliver the children of Israel and that God was going to use him. And so he tried to do so by the arm of flesh and ended up 40 years in a wilderness. So now later on, when he's there receiving the law, he, he comes down and he sees how the people are involved in, in sexual excess and, and various sins, and, and, and God is, God's wrath is hot against them. You would think that Moses could be tempted to say, that's a great idea, wipe them out and start it over with me, but he doesn't. Moses actually interceded. In Exodus 32, 11 through 13, it says, Moses implored the Lord as God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger. Relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised, I will give your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. He interceded on their behalf. Please don't destroy them. That's intercession. In the New Testament, we have Stephen's prayer for his murderers as he was about to be put to death. It says in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, he fell on his knees, cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's intercession, praying for them. And so your desire for God to save others drives you to intercede on their behalf. And you do so fervently. James 5.16 says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. A fourth thing, praying for the lost to be saved includes the giving of thanks. So we lift up the lost and we pray with a thankful heart that we were able to share the gospel with them. And we care about people and we pray that they may be saved. And sometimes we put feet to our prayers. We invite them to church. We invite them to events that they may hear a gospel message and get saved. And when they're saved, we rejoice and we give thanks to God for that. When you look in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, it says that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. 
And so you do so with thankfulness. You give thanks because you know that God is able to save. Now, sometimes we restrict our prayers to those who are related to us or perhaps for our friends. But I want you to notice what Paul says here in 1 Timothy 2, in verse 1, when he says, this should be made, he says, on behalf of all men. And then he goes on in verse 2 to say this. He said, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Notice what he's saying here. This includes kings and all who are in authority. You know, uh, it was a while back now I was concerned because law enforcement personnel, many of you remember, it's not that long ago, were being gunned down. And we were seeing quite a number of events that were being published in the news and papers, magazines, radio, TV. Police officers that were getting gunned down. And I got concerned. You see, I have friends and I have relatives in law enforcement. And so it, it struck home to me because I know that these people are on the street and they're doing what they can to help us and therefore I was concerned for them. And, I, and, and so I, I, I came to church and I shared two times in a row, two weeks in a row, I, I prayed specifically for their safety because they were being assaulted and killed and all. And, and, and as that happened, you know, there were people who didn't understand. Um, you see, I, I was on my way one time to church, and uh, as I was driving here to church, I was coming on uh, Pipeline here, right in front of us here, and I was driving north on Pipeline, and you get to Riverside Drive. And when you get to Riverside Drive, the, the speed limit changes, and... Uh, so I was going the speed limit as I entered across the riverside going north. And then I took my foot off of the gas because, you know, just to let the, uh, let, let the engine break, if you will, and it, it slows down. Well, as I'm driving, I, I look in my rear view mirror and there's a black and white behind me. You know what a black and white is. And as I look, there's this black and white and there goes the lights. And he pulls me over and he walks up to me and says, you're speeding. It was my brother-in-law <laughs> who goes to this church, or used to. <laughs> and I said, no, I wasn't. He goes, yes, you were. He says, it's a 40 and you're going 45. I can give you a ticket. I said, you'll become an illustration like he is right now. And so we had a conversation, you know, and obviously, you know, he wasn't going to ticket me because I was slowing down. But the point is this, you know, I have friends and relatives in law enforcement. And, uh, and, and I didn't like them. I'll be honest with you. I didn't like police for a long time. Uh, that's because I was breaking the law. And, and I, I discovered that criminals have a way of disliking officers. I discovered that. Well, since I got saved, I, I started realizing that that these people, and we'll see this in a minute, I'll give you scripture related to this, are, are actually there for a purpose and all. And so when I was praying for people in law enforcement, I did it two weeks in a row because I was concerned. Uh, we lost members of this church. You thought, you know, that I shouldn't be praying for law enforcement. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that very specifically, that's what we're looking at. It says here that giving up thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. You see, what he's speaking about here is praying for human government. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, this is what the Apostle Paul writes. He said, Let every soul be subject to the governing authority, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject 
not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Of course, this kind of prayer for government is very difficult sometimes for us to do. Government officials very often are disrespectful or arrogant towards Christians. California is run by officials who seem bent on destroying our state. And it's difficult. It is difficult sometimes to pray for them because of the arrogance, because of the disrespect, because of the disregard, because of the things that are done that are undermining and working against, in many ways, the things that we as Christians truly do believe. Disrespect for, for Christians is not just in the United States, it's really worldwide. I was reading some things about that. Believers receiving disrespect is something that happens in other countries. For example, in 2016, Russia passed a law restricting evangelism outside of church precincts. In 2017, six states in India passed what are called anti-conversion laws. In Myanmar, Nepal, and Bhutan, those, those countries have enacted similar laws. In Saudi Arabia, conversion from Islam is apostasy and is punishable by death. So if you become a believer in Saudi Arabia, you can be executed for that. And so we see that worldwide. In the United States, Christians are dealing with laws that restrict freedom of religion. I read of a ministry in Lake City, Florida, that has cared for the poor for over 31 years, but it has been told that they cannot post a picture of Jesus, exhibit the Ten Commandments, have a banner reading, Jesus is Lord, or give out Bibles to the needy if they expect to continue receiving USDA food. So this is a church being told by the government, you cannot be a church if you want to give help to the poor, and we supply the food for that. The owners of a Colorado bakery were facing a year in prison for refusing to bake a cake for a homosexual wedding. The Colorado Attorney General's office filed a discrimination complaint against Masterpiece Cake Shop. U.S. law protects Twitter and allows them to censor views that they disagree with. On Monday, October 9, 2017, Twitter censored one of Marsha Blackburn's, who is a congresswoman from Tennessee, one of her Twitter videos in which she proudly defended her pro-life record. In the censored campaign ad, Blackburn said that she stopped the sale of body parts by Planned Parenthood. And she was censored. They finally rescinded the censorship, but that's because of the outcry. Some of you saw the uh, video that went viral of a homosexual Seattle coffee shop owner who kicked out a group of people from his establishment for being Christian. And he said the most profane things concerning them and the Lord Jesus Christ. But what would have happened if Christians kicked homosexuals out of anything? So we see this. I'm not trying to get you angry. You're already mad. <laughs> I'm simply saying we see this. We do see this. We're not blind to this. So it becomes very difficult. I can remember in 1987, a so-called work of art that had a crucifix that was submerged in urine was protected by free speech. So apparently law protects this kind of discrimination against Christians. And it seems that it does sometimes, doesn't it? This can cause anger and this can cause bitterness towards government and government officials. We need to remember that during the time of the writing of 1 Timothy, Nero was the Caesar. And history records that Caesar Nero hated believers. He did some acts of brutality that are unheard of things. If you read Schaeffer's uh, History of Christianity and others like that, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you will see historical examples of what Caesar did, where he would he would take Christians and he would sew them in, in the uh, skins of animals, Christians alive, sew them in the skins of animals and throw them to wild dogs. 
and the wild dogs would tear the Christians apart. How he took them and dipped them in, in pitch, tar, and, and placed them on posts and, and ignited them and then rode his chariot madly around as Christians were becoming uh, human candles. He hated Christians and he put them to death. He blamed the, the, uh, the burning of Rome on Christians. He, he hated them. And when you read concerning his life, he, he was a very evil man. He was perverted. He was a persecutor of the faith. And yet, Christians were commanded to pray for Caesar Nero. Isn't that interesting? In 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, the apostle said, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. This is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. He said, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That comes from the writers of the New Testament who are undergoing incredible persecution, yet you pray for the government. You pray that they might be saved. One of the more practical reasons why you pray that they might be saved is someone said it like this, good people make good laws. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Someone said, if we prayed for the government with the same energy that is spent on criticizing and lobbying, it might be impacted for good. Remember that the most important thing is for government officials to be saved. And so he says, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Why? Well, who? For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We pray that we might continue to live in peace, that we might have the freedom to serve the Lord you see, when laws are ignored, chaos ensues. I was just in Tijuana this last Friday. And I can tell you, when laws are ignored, chaos ensues. I haven't driven in Tijuana in a long time. I didn't drive. I just, somebody else did so I could cover my eyes and pray. <laughs> Amazing. Stop signs are suggestions. And you get to these traffic circles and, and people are darting in and out, running through the stop signs. You know, when law is ignored, chaos ensues. I, on the way to church just this morning, I was coming uh, up a uh, pipeline going north and, and uh, I was by uh, the shopping center just down the road and there's a red light and there's a woman at the red light. I have a green, she has a red as I'm driving and approaching the green. She decides to take a left turn on the red. And I know that if a police officer were to pull her over, I know what she'd say. Well, there was nobody, you know, I was safe, it didn't cause any problems, what's the big deal? And I was thinking about that as I was driving here because when I, when I was about 13, two friends and I went to the movies. My mom and dad dropped us off and it was, I lived in Norwalk and, and the movie house that we went to, the theater was in, in Downey and it was right off of uh, Firestone Boulevard for some of you who may know that area. And, um, and the, the, the movie ended and my friends and I were walking towards our home, so we were going west from Downey, rather east from Downey. And as we were, we were uh, going home, walking on Firestone, it was 10 o'clock, there was, there was no traffic. See, there was a time and at 10 there was no traffic. So there was no traffic. So we decided that we were cars. And we went into the traffic lanes and we were running, chasing each other. We're 13 years old, we're real goofy. And we're chasing each other around in traffic lanes. When a police officer pulls over to the side of the road and calls us to him and he says, what are you guys doing? We said, we're, uh, we're, we're going home. We, you know, one, we're breaking curfew because there was something called curfew. If you were under 18, you weren't supposed to be out at 10 o'clock. They had a curfew and we were walking and now we're in this, in, and so he says, what are you doing? He, we're going home, we're waiting, well, our parents are gonna come pick us up and we're just walking 
in the direction that the car will be traveling in to pick us up. And the officer says to us, and he says, you were in, the, you were in traffic lanes, you were running, that's a dangerous thing. And I responded to him, I said, there was no car. There were no, no cars. You know, we weren't in danger. I thought I was talking to my mom. See, if I had said that to my mom, she'd have said, well, you're right, stupid, but don't do that again. <laughs> not the cop. He says, so you think that laws are based on whether or not you agree with them? That's how it works. And he gave me a lecture. I'll never forget it. He was right. Laws are there not because of I'm so good, but because I'm so bad. They're there to keep me from doing certain things and to ensure certain things can actually happen, that we might live peaceable lives, that there is no chaos, that there's no confusion. And so that's the whole bottom line. That's the point. Disorder and persecution is harmful. He says, ignore, don't ignore, keep praying. Pray and be the best citizens that you can be. That gives to you an opportunity to be a witness. And secondly, it can also help to keep the environment in such a way that, that the faith can be presented. And also, younger believers will be given the opportunity to grow and mature in their faith. So be aware of that. He says in verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so he's saying God is pleased when we pray for our officials, as well as for all who are lost, to pray for them that they might be saved is good and is acceptable to God. But the question has to be asked why. And he says in verse 4, because God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So who does God want to save? He wants to save everyone. In Ezekiel 18, 23, it says this, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? Isaiah 45, 22, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God. There is no other. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So praying for their salvation is according to his will. He says in verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So Paul cites three unquestioned truths of the gospel here. First, he says, there is but one God. You find that in the old and new, obviously. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 5 and 6. Though there be, though there be, uh, though there be that are called gods, many that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there are gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So one, there is but one God. Two, there's only one way to approach him. And I want you to see this. There is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One God, one mediator. I don't know what your religious upbringing is, and I certainly don't want to insult your mom or your dad or grandma or whomever most sincerely was teaching you what they believed. Keep that in mind as I say this. I was raised as a Roman Catholic. My mama tried to teach me to pray as a, as a young boy, and she said to me, and I'll, I still remember it, my mama said to me, you need to pray to Mary. And I said to her, why? And she says, because sometimes the Lord is busy. <laughs> and she said, you know how, how when you want something from your dad, how you will, you will approach me and ask me to tell your dad? And I said, yes. She said, that's how it is in heaven. You speak to his mom and she brings your request. Now that made sense to me, because I spoke to my mom. My mom would speak to my father. So I never really questioned it. Why would I? And my mom introduced me to someone named St. Anthony. Now St. Anthony was a patron saint of a variety of things, including the one who helped you when you lost something. 
So my mom taught me a prayer. St. Anthony, St. Anthony, please come around, for there is something that cannot be found. And I would say whatever it was, a million dollars. You know, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I, at a certain point, I was loaded and drunk almost every day, so almost every day I was losing my keys. And so I'd be walking around the house. My mom would help me. It was like an Easter egg hunt. She would help me find them because I'd walk in so wasted, I didn't know where I put my car keys. So I still remember standing in my mom's front, my dad's front room saying, Anthony, help me. I can't find my keys. And my mom would follow me around as we went around the house like a scavenger hunt. And that's what we would do. So I was taught at a very early age that you could ask a lot of different people uh, for help, you know. But when I got saved, what I decided to do is look to see if that's in Scripture. And here we have it where he says there is one God, one mediator. Now Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And so when I read the scripture, I, I, I appreciate those who have gone before us and all, but I speak to the one who can help me. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I go to God through him. And that's what Paul is saying here. There's only one mediator. There aren't several. You don't have to take a lifetime to get to know various saints. You don't, you don't go to, to the mother of Jesus Christ. You go straight to God through the son, Jesus Christ. That's a privilege we have, and that's found here in Scripture, and that's what God is teaching us to do, that we go through Jesus Christ, and he's the one who answers. And then he says that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. When it speaks of him giving himself, it's voluntarily, vicariously, victoriously. He gave himself a ransom. That reveals the sufficiency of his sacrifice for those who are willing to trust him. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 10, it says, To this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. In Matthew 20, verse 28, The Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So we go to God through Jesus Christ, who is the ransom and is testified of. That's who we preach in the gospel Verse 7, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ, not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I was appointed. I was appointed. I was placed. I was set in this position by God, not by man. I was appointed a preacher. A preacher is a messenger that has public authority who conveys official messages. He's saying, I am God's ambassador. I am a proclaimer of the divine word. Ephesians 3.8, he says it like this. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He says, I was appointed a preacher. He says, I was appointed an apostle. Jesus' authoritative messenger, he's saying, to the church, appointed by him, and I'm a teacher. Now notice, a teacher of the Gentiles. Him being a teacher of the Gentiles leads to his death because Paul had the, the calling to minister the gospel of grace to Gentiles. When you go through the book of Acts, as we've been going through it on Wednesday, some of you who've been with me traveling through Acts have seen this, that Paul was arrested and ultimately he dies because he was preaching the gospel to Gentiles. And it caused such an uproar, he was arrested and ultimately put to death for that. He was revealing the true faith of God to Gentiles. In Galatians 2, 7 through 9, he says, on the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. So God has strategically placed me as a preacher. Preaching is appealing to the will. When the ministry of preaching takes place and the Holy Spirit 
is working, those who are listening are being given an appeal to make a decision. Apostle is a place of authority. A teacher is an individual who is gifted by the Spirit to, to give information that provokes people to learn. And so a preacher is calling you to make a decision. A teacher is giving you information with the encouragement for you to assimilate that and be transformed. That came under the title apostle, a person of authority who had been strategically set in this position to take the word of God out to the world, to pray for all men, but especially his calling was to reach the Gentiles who are outside of the promises of God. And so he says, that's what he is. And then finally he says this, verse eight, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. This is a command for men to be spiritual leaders. This does not diminish women. From the beginning, women are extremely influential. As a woman who is the first testifier of the resurrection of Christ, it was through a woman, obviously, that Messiah was born. And in the New Testament, you find a number of women who are mentioned who are evidences of the faith and goodness of the Lord, Tabitha and others in the New Testament that are used as models. So Paul is not giving some negative commentary that women have no place of ministry. But Paul is saying, I desire men to be the leaders. I desire men to be the pray, war, prayer warriors. I desire men to take the place that God has called them to take and to be the kind of men that transforms homes and families, to be the kind of men that makes churches powerful. I remember years ago, now we were at a retreat, our retreat, a woman's retreat, and, and there was a visitor, a lady who didn't go to our church, who was there because she was invited by somebody else to go, and she began to cry on a Saturday. She was crying, and one of our women approached her, thinking there was something wrong, and asked her, what is wrong? And she said, she said, I don't go to this fellowship. She says, I go to another church. And she says, we have never had an entire weekend that has been devoted for the women to, to be able to go and be taught to worship and fellowship. We've never had that in my church. She says, because if the women don't show up on Sunday, we can't have church because the men won't. Because the men won't. She said, the men in my church do not rise up and lead. They just don't. See, when this church began many years ago now, I had been an assistant pastor as a young man. I got ordained in the ministry when I was 28 years old. And I'd been an assistant pastor in another ministry. And one of the ladies in the church held a woman's Bible study and she had a worship leader. And her worship leader was beginning to introduce some things that just weren't biblically solid. And so, the senior pastor at that time was 22 years old. So he's 22, I'm about 28, 29 at that time. And we have to sit this woman down who's in her 40s and the woman who's leading the woman's ministry there at that time was in her late 50s. So to this older woman, we were just young kids who didn't know what we were talking about. So she made an appointment for her to come and meet with the senior pastor and me so she could read us the riot act so that she could teach us what real ministry is all about. And so there's this 22, 23 year old, there's me around 29, seated in a room where this older woman's kind of wagging her, her finger at us, telling us how things are going to be. Now, I'm not the kind of person that you can do that to. I'm just not. You know, I wasn't the senior pastor, I was just there, but no, you know, no, no. See, my mama, <laughs> My mom was a black belt in telling you what was on her mind. <laughs> Bottom line, she was a strong, strong woman, my mom. And my mom, my mom had no trouble telling me whatever. That was mama, and I grew up with that. And when I became a pastor in this church, 
my mom tried to tell me some things. I sat her down and I said, we're not going there and you're not telling me anything. I said, do you know who I am? She said, who do you think you are? I said, I know who I am. I'm the pastor of this church, and you're not. So you're not telling me what God's going to tell me to do. See, if you can tell your mama that, you can tell anybody that. That's the bottom line. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. That's a fact. So see, I am under the spirit of the Lord, not some dominating person, whether male or female. Okay, that's a, that's a given. So when this woman is trying to tell us off, the senior pastor's intimidated. He didn't know what to do, so I stepped in. I said, we're not going that way. This is what scripture says. This is what we're going to do. I kept that in my memory when this church, church began. I began working with the men first. We did not have women's ministry here for two years because I wanted to give myself over to the men to teach the men to be men. Because I believe if there's anything lacking then and now, it's male leadership. So men, we need to rise up and be what God has called us to be. We have to. We have to. My, here we go. My wife is not the pastor of this church. My wife is my wife. And she is a sheep in this church the way everybody else is. That's the reason why I will teach the first study at the women's retreats to remind the women that the woman who is leading this is under the, the authority of her husband, who is the pastor of the church. Why? Because God has called us men to take the lead. That's why. And so that's why I encourage you men to rise up and be men. Listen, your wife needs a man in the house, not another little boy. She doesn't need to raise another child. She needs you. I was talking to a young woman in our church just this last week. I was speaking to her, and uh, she's young. She's in her in early, early 20s. And I was talking with some of the ladies and a couple of the guys, young men, and I said, I feel sorry for you because you've got a lot of uh, men who are boys. You need a man in your life. I said, do you, want, do you want to dominate some man? Do you want to be the leader in the house? She says, no, I want a man. And so that's the bottom line, men. I'm telling you, my wife doesn't need another child. She needs a man that she can respect. She needs a man that she can listen to. She needs a man who loves her and tenderly leads her, but is not going to be pushed because God is going to tell me what to do. And we as a family, we will serve the Lord. That's how it works. And it's not meanness. And it's not brutality. And, it, and I don't bully my wife. And I don't scream at my wife. And I don't. No. It's that she knows that the man she's married to has a spine. And I know that my knee is bowed to Jesus Christ first and foremost. And when Marie and I were dating, I said this. You may leave me, but he never will. I will always follow him first, and you come behind him. That's what our relationship's going to be like, and that's what it's been for all these years. Why? Because God has called the man to lead. Not because we're better, but because that's our responsibility. And when I hand ministry over to my wife, that is mine, I am not doing what God has called me to do. So men, wake up. Your wives want a man in the house. They want a man who will lead, not a brute, not a bully, a man who loves, a man that they can trust, a man that they are in strength, strengthened by. My dad was a man. My mom was, was a powerful woman. But when daddy was there, my mom was a submitted woman. Why? Because my dad loved her enough to lay his life down for her. And a man who will lay his life down for his wife will be followed by that wife wherever he goes. My wife... This is the truth. My wife, this is the, if I walk to the, to, the, to the edge of hell, my wife will be right behind me. She won't push me in. <laughs> but she'll be right behind me supporting me. That's a fact. And why is that? Why is that? Because when she and I met, and when she and I began to go out, I told her, I'm going to be a man of God. That's what I am. I'm a man under orders of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I am and I will follow him as far as he takes me, as long as he wants me, and you will go with me to where he calls us to go. Men become leaders. He didn't say, I will that the women raise their hands. Why? Because you women so very often are so spiritually minded. You don't even have to have a command like that. You raise up holy hands to the Lord. Men, raise your hands to the Lord. Worship him. Follow him. Be the example. Be the hero in your family. 
be the priest of the home. I could bring my wife out right now and I could hand her a microphone and I could say, honey, am I the real deal or am I just pretending? I'd be willing to do that. Anybody who wants to talk to my wife, ask them what the man is that she's been married to for all these years. Ask if I do these things. She'll tell you. She'll say, no, he does what he says because he loves the Lord. And men, I want you to have the same testimony that your wife will say, I married a man of God because a godly woman wants a godly man. <laughs> Listen carefully. Listen carefully. A godly woman wants a godly man. A woman who's not godly doesn't care. But a godly woman wants a godly man. I have become the man that I am, fear of the Lord and love for this woman because she wants a godly man. I want to be the man that she'll always love. She won't look at another man because I'm going to be the man that she, is the only man she'll ever want. I'm going to be that man. I want to be that man. I made a decision. You could bring my kids up. You can bring my grandkids up. You can ask them, does your father live what he's saying? Does your grandfather live what he's saying? And if they're capable of answering questions like that, every one of them will say he lives it. Why? Because there's something greater to me than whether the Dodgers win today. <laughs> Which I hope they do, by the way. <laughs> there's something greater to me than that. Eternity is greater than that. Eternity is greater than that. I don't want to go to heaven without my wife. I don't want to go to heaven without my, my children. I do not want to go to heaven without my grandbabies. I want the Rosales clan to be representing in heaven. And that's what I've done. And that's what I will do, is I will remain faithful as a man of God. And men, I exhort you to do the same. I exhort you to do the same. Be that man. And this may sound like a shameless plug. It's not. It's just a concluding exhortation. If you can go to the retreat, go. We are there to help you become the men you want to be. That's what we're doing. We're trying to help you become men of God. This church needs men to rise up and lead. This church needs you. And we need you to stand up in these last moments, these last days and be counted as God's man. And I will do all that I, as a man, can do to be an example and encourager to you in that, because that's how important this really is. Men, rise up, pray, and seek the Lord, and let's see what God will do with us in the coming years. Let's see what Jesus will do.